the like. So on the one hand side, we have the view that vulnerability is a property only of some who should be afforded special protection and additional attention. However, this view is criticized by some. Some argue that vulnerability cannot be a property just of some. It's a uniting property of all humans. So I'm citing here Marianne Davies. She's saying, at the same time, an approach that seeks to acknowledge multiple views but casts only some as vulnerable is insufficient. It ignores the fact that vulnerability is universal and that the failure to acknowledge this universality is divisive. Moreover, the vulnerable are not the others, for no one is invulnerable. So we can distinguish these two view here. Just to give you a few um, uh, points uh, that are relevant to this de definition. So we have on the one hand side the view that uh, vulnerability is only a property of some who are in need of special protection and additional attention. And either um, medical guidelines, for example, but also other documents, they give you list of populations they consider vulnerable, so prisoners, uh, minorities, uh, women, refugees, prisoners, and the like, while others they focus on the criterion they think that all these vulnerable individuals share. So for example, the vulnerable are considered as those unable to give informed consent, those unable to protect their own interests, those more likely to be exploited, those uh, susceptible to additional harm, those at higher risk of neglect or those lacking basic rights. However, you can find a counterexample to all of them. So, um, yes, some individuals may be unable to give informed consent. Children are an example. Nevertheless, for example, by um, uh, decision making by, property, by proxy, we can protect them. And um, also, if you just focus on this, you might oversee other vulnerabilities. Um, for example, you can, be, uh, you can be able to give informed consent. Um, however, you don't really understand what the research is about, or it's not in your best interest, or you might consent due to economic interests, or because this is the only way you can get some kind of health care etc. And the same applies to all these others. They seem to, all these definitions, they seem to pick out one part of vulnerability, but they don't seem to convey the whole picture. On the other hand, there's the focus on vulnerability as a property of everyone, vulnerability as a part of the human condition. This is most uh, the, the use that is very prevalent also in continental philosophy, in analytical analytic one and in medical ethics it's more the focus on the left side. It's also regarded that uh, vulnerability is an expression of the finitude of the human conditions and it's usually in the literature to link to having a body, the possibility of being harmed or being mortal. As I said before, recently some authors started to uh, to use vulnerability language for the case of animals, also in the more analytic tradition, in the continental one it has been done for some longer time. So I'm giving this uh, citation of Ferdosian, Beecham and Gluck. They say chimpanzees can and should be viewed as vulnerable subjects of research, modeled in the same ways uh, humans are vulnerable in research setting where we see similar vulnerabilities in human populations. These vulnerabilities should be addressed using methods and regulatory rules that are fundamentally similar to those used for similarly vulnerable human groups such as children and prisoners which provide serviceable models. So, the assumption is that um, the, the, this use of vulnerability actually mirrors some way of vulnerability language in medical ethics. So you see that there are actually three disparate views. We have vulnerability as a property of everyone, 
On the one hand side, you have vulnerability as a property of only some <coughs> in particular domain where this is uh, where vulnerability is seen as something normative. It calls for uh, special protection. And the link here we have a conflict in the literature. Then we have animal vulnerability and its link to general human vulnerability as well as the, uh, the view that vulnerability is only a property of some is quite unclear. So let's look a bit closer at the notion of vulnerability to see what we can learn from it and to, to, give, to be able to define it properly. So it's important that we have a definition, a clear definition of vulnerability that can resolve this conflict in the literature because vulnerability fulfills this um, function or this role of drawing our attention to morally salient situations. Um, if we talk about vulnerable populations, we talk about something that needs to be addressed, that um, uh, needs to be given attention. And a good definition of vulnerability should be able to account for this. Without such a definition, it's not um, possible to outline what vulnerability means, what its moral implications are, and what its differences are to other concepts. And once we have a good definition of vulnerability in general, we can see whether it can be meaningfully extended to animals, and we can outline its normative implications. So what kind of definition do we need? What conditions does it need to fulfill? I think four conditions should be fulfilled by a satisfying uh, definition of vulnerability. First, it should be able to account for, to bo for both understandings of vulnerability. Vulnerability is the property only of some, and vulnerability as a property of all, everyone by their very nature, or at least some humans by their very nature. It should be formal in scope so that it's easily applicable to different cases, contexts and scenario given that vulnerability fulfills this role in medical ethics, in healthcare ethics, in humanitarian aid, etc. Um, the definition of vulnerability should be able um, to distinguish between morally relevant and morally irrelevant uh, manifestations or instances of vulnerability. I will come back to that. So not all, all vulnerabilities need to be addressed or are morally relevant. And um, a good definition of vulnerability should also explain why um, some vulnerabilities and not others require action. Um, I think the solution is an explicative definition which respects some central uses of the term as we use it in every, our everyday language, but it is stipulative um, on, on, about others and this will guarantee that the definition of vulnerability can fulfill its function to draw our attention uh, to those who are in need of special protection. So let's look at vulnerability ascription. We can we often say in everyday language X is vulnerable to Y. So, we're, um, so uh, for example, computers are vulnerable to viruses. A country is vulnerable to political sanctions. The ecosystem is vulnerable to destruction. The planet is vulnerable to climate change and the like. So we see that. Um, it's, uh, the, there are always two parts in the definition and it also shows us that vulnerability is a dispositional concept. So um, similar to fragility, solubility and the like. So first of all, uh, vulnerability ascription expressed the potentiality of some X to manifest some state Y and we usually regard this state Y as uh, undesirable. We can think of some counterexamples in everyday language, but this is usually not the ones we are interested in when vulnerability is used as a technical term. And um, 
And so the assumption is usually you value x, so the first part, in its current stage, state, but x is disposed to be adversely or negatively affected. So you prefer that x rather stays in its current state. Um, formulated in a negative way, um, invulnerability would then be that an entity cannot be adversely affected. While vulnerability generally, in the case of sentient and non-sentient being, means that it um, cannot be. No, invulnerability means it cannot, while vulnerability implies that some entity may be negatively afflicted. So, uh, yes? Could you return to Sorry. the previous slide? Just, just a clarification yeah. question. So, vulnerability is a, is a disposition uh, with manifestation Y, the un undesirable state Y? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not the same Y that over. So, virus are not undesirable manifestation of computers. Well, you don't want your... It's, uh, yes, that's true. Um, it, it's one of the pos possible manifestations your computer can have to. And if you say, oh, my computer is vulnerable to viruses, you say it's disposed or it's at risk to have a virus, and you care about this risk. You, do, you prefer that your laptop does not have a virus and that you can continue working. Okay. So this is one possible form of manifestation, but I just come now to this okay. language of manifestations. So usually, um, when we talk about vulnerability in everyday language, very often we, um, we recognize some value. It's uh, in the form of a value recognition. You don't say, uh, this desk is vulnerable. It, it's more about entities we care about. And um, as said, vulnerab vulnerability is a dispositional property, um, often defined as extrinsic dispositional property. And we should um, distinguish three different points. So we can distinguish three different points. So uh, first of all, a reason why something or someone is vulnerable. Second, the conditions of manifestations. And third, the manifestations. So this is the final uh, stage. So for example, um, you can say uh, a, a given glass is fragile. Fragility is a disposition. So um, the glass is fragile because of its atomic structure. The conditions of manifestation are, for example, me dropping the glass. And the manifestation would be the, the shattering into pieces of glass. And um, so I come now to um, what I mentioned before to be a stipulative definition of vulnerability. I concentrate from now on on the vulnerability of uh, sentient beings. I narrow down on the vulnerability of human beings. Uh, the ecosystem, etc. would also be important, but it's a bit out of the scope of my uh, proper research. So I focus on humans, so I think vulnerable individuals are those who have on the one hand side welfare interests, so welfare interests defined as X is in the interest of Y, for example, if I suffer from pneumonia, it would be in my interest to receive antibiotics or medication, and agency interests, which are your personal values, objectives in life that you uh, wish to pursue, which can uh, can be frustrated by yourself. You can ex uh, you can act against your own welfare or agency interest by the circumstances and by other living beings. So the first part here is the reason for vulnerability ascription. Um, while this is the manifestation, so the conditions of manifestation is the interaction. Um, of the vulnerable being with itself, uh, with unlucky or problematic circumstances or other uh, living beings who act as um, the cause of the manifestation of vulnerability. So there are different forms of manifestation of vulnerability which should be distinguished. On the one hand side we have non-preventable harm. So sometimes you hurt yourself, it cannot be prevented, uh, you, no one did something wrong. 
and we have sometimes morally justified harm. So, um, for example, when you go to to dentist, if you um, conceive harm very broadly, you are harmed in some way. But it is, um, if you have given your consent before, it's morally acceptable. Um, However, there are other cases where this harm is morally problematic, and this is the claim. Uh, this is the case when um, your welfare and um, agency interests are not considered in the way they should. Um, so, um, in some situations, someone is responsible. Re responsible towards you regarding your interest and fails to take them into account in a fair way. And um, in this situation, when you have a morally protected interest and a moral agent who is responsible, we don't talk about mere welfare or agency interests anymore, we talk about claims. And claims deserve uh, fair consideration. You have different claims and usually other moral agents should consider the claims of others in a fair way. Um, thereby we can distinguish different levels of claim. We have vital claims, we have more fundamental claims, for example about bodily integrity, and then we have also mere interests and mere preferences and they have less, they are morally less important than um, claims. So, in situations in which your legitimate claims are unjustly considered, you either incur wrongful harm or mere wrongs. So, um, for example, I discriminate a person uh, based on his or her religion or things like that. I consider um, his or her interest as less important than I... Um, I unfairly take the interests of this person into account. So, and the person as a consequence may incur wrongful harm or mere wrongs, that is, for example, you are not always negatively afflicted, you are not always harmed. For example, if someone reads your, your, your secretly reads your emails, um, breaches, uh, th then you usually regard this as morally problematic, even if you might not be aware of this. If someone breaks into your house, takes pictures, you, you don't notice this, you will never learn about this. You usually think this is morally problematic, although it doesn't really affect you, you will never learn about it. Uh, same about breaches in confidentiality at hospitals. Um, even if you do not learn about it, uh, you still don't want them to happen. So, um, usually humans are Thankfully, given some consideration, um, some groups might, I think it got rarer today, it was more of a problem earlier, um, sometimes groups are not considered at all, and this also of course falls under unfair consideration. If you don't consider a group at all, when you should, I think this is a form of unfair consideration. So and these manifestations are morally problematic. So now we might ask, well, um, why are some individuals so more vulnerable than others? Well, because they are more likely that we unjustly consider their interests. And this may be due to biases, prejudices, not being aware of group-specific needs, etc. And this, so and the, the people who are more likely to have their interest comparatively uh, in comparison to other groups unjustly considered, they can be considered as particularly vulnerable. And this use resolves this, the problem of this two disparate view of vulnerability in the literature. So we have only one type of vulnerability, but different likelihoods of manifestations with different individuals. So vulnerability is a matter of degree and um, whether an individual manifests unjustifiably this vulnerability may depend on the context with whom she's, she or he is interacting, etc. 
So to define particularly vulnerable groups, this leads me to the special protection thesis suggested by Tabellion et al. Individuals with a greater likelihood of being denied adequate satisfaction of their legitimate claims, uh, for example, due to unjust consideration, I added this to sort of special attention, care, and protection. So, in the first step, we now resolved the issue about the due disparate view. We have now a, a conception of vulnerability which encompasses everyone, but we can also define who the part, those particularly vulnerable are. They are those who are more likely to have their um, legitimate claims unjustly considered and as a consequence they are more likely to incur wrongful harm or mere wrongs. Now, one may say, well, what, why, so you seem to be able to reduce vulnerability <coughs> language to just some other phenomena, so why, why should we talk about vulnerability if it just can be reduced to another description? Should we not keep to vulnerability and not really define it? I think um, so that's the first criticism. And the second is, well, okay, this does not, so vulnerability is just equivalent to being more likely to be denied uh, uh, the cons fair consideration of your claim. So it does not add anything to moral discourse. We already have that when we talk about the fair weighing of interest. But I think vulnerability language are still useful. They work as uh, the Marcus expressed it as a needed moral safeguard and they draw our attention to morally salient situations and um, namely that some are likely not to be given what they are factually due or that they are more likely not to be given what they are factually, factually due. So let's come now to the implications uh, for the domain of animal ethics. So far, I mostly concentrated on human vulnerability, but it seems that this definition can be made fruitful for the case of some animals. Some animals have welfare interests, that, ha that means uh, some X is in their interest. So for example, physical integrity, the avoidance of pain, not suffer from mental stress, um, stress is all in their interests. So some animals have welfare interests. Some animals even have agency interests. For example, so they have their own goals they pursue, their own um, objectives, uh, etc. Examples may be advancement in a social hierarchy. <coughs> some animals care about raising their offsprings. Some animals are future related and uh, seem to care about co uh, continued existence, etc. I think this group is smaller, of course, than the first one. And um, we have in some, uh, there are many moral agents who could possibly frustrate these interests. Um, Humans interact with animals in different ways. But now you could say, well, animals aren't morally considerable, they don't count at all. But I think this is rather unlikely, most people have the intuition that animals matter at least a little bit, you're not allowed, or we think it's morally wrong to just uh, kill an animal or torture an animal for your personal fun. Um, I'm not showing any regard to the animals. Most people find this extremely morally problematic and counterintuitive. Another view is to say, well, you have duties in regards to animals. However, you own, only have this duty in regards to other humans, so the owner of the animal, etc. However, so the, um, um, Immanuel Kant, of course, was one the defender of this indirect duty view, Peter Carotters nowadays is another example. Um, however, we usually think um, that what is going, what, what happens when you torture an animal, you, you owe it to the animal, him or herself, not to torture it and not to its, his or her owner. So I would defend here a direct duty view. So that means um, animals matter for their own sake. We have to consider their interests fairly, 
and uh, when we have the power over the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of their interest, we should take them into fair consideration. And this implies that animals have leg sometimes legitimate claims. So, um, so some animals qualify as vulnerable. The question is though, is this, are we now talking about this general vulnerability that we talked about in the case of human? Or is there some types of vulnerability in animals, increased vulnerability or particular vulnerability that requires special protection and additional attention? So the question is, um, do some animals face a comparatively higher risk of incurring unjustified harm or wrongs? Um, for this, I think the notion of um, here comes the notion of speciesism into play. So, speciesism is the view that human interests count more just because they are the interest of the interests of humans. However, uh, why should the moral significance of the same interest differ according to the species if there are no associated other differences? Um, so, speciesism is seen in analogy to racism, sexism, etc., where um, morally irrelevant properties, usually biological properties, are used to discount the interests of some groups. So in the case of gender, the interests of women are discounted because they are the interests of women. In the case of um, racism, race is used, and in speciesism, um, species membership is seen as morally irrelevant criteria. Um, so I start here from the premise that uh, discounting uh, interest due to species related um, discrimination is morally not justified. If you think I go wrong here, then of course all I'm going to say now would not follow. So yeah. So, um, how should we, according to, if we want to avoid speciesism, how should we weigh um, or consider animals' interests? Well, um, um, a basic first principle, which is accepted in most literature, in recent literature in animal ethics, is the principle of equal consideration. Now, for example, Peter Singer was, I think, one of the first ones who phrased this in animal liberation. So it just states that similar interests should count alike, regardless of whose interest they are. So if the interest is has the same weight, we should give it the same moral weight, regardless of who actually has this interest. So as I said before, problem, biological properties should, if all things are the same, not matter herein. Um, now, you might say, well, okay, can, yeah. Can I just ask another question of yeah. precision? So, are you claiming that, that, you, you, that the principle of equal consideration is, is, is right independently of the normative theory of ethics you're... you're of a, a what? Your normative ethic, ethical theory. I yes. think I, I, I would... I think it's a basic principle that I would accept for most uh, okay. theories, yeah. That you should not discriminate based on morally irrelevant properties such as um, race, gender, um, or species for the, in the case of speciesism. I, don't, I think it's compatible but, but, but with... It's, it's not what you're saying, it's not what is written. What is written is that similar interests should count alike. You're not saying your your answer is much more sophisticated. Yeah, sorry. It's sometimes so, I didn't want to. <laughs> okay, so because it's different to say okay, all interests are, are the same, and I, I understand no. Peter Singer. Peter Singer is saying that. But, uh, yeah, okay. No, you, you really. It's about if the interest. So, for example, we have the okay. Imagine pain can be from one to ten, and now we have. Uh, um, a human person um, feeling a pain of eight, 
and an animal feeling pain of eight. So it's for both the exact same feeling. And we don't have any other information here, for example, or for example that um, more humans will be negatively afflicted by seeing this person suffering, etc. So from a moral point of view, if you don't have any supplementary information, if you just look at these two cases, they are equally bad. There's no reason to say why the suffering um, in the case of human is worse in, uh, than the animal one, if it's the same level. Okay, of, co of course you can then add things to your exper thought experiment and say, well, um, the, the human may, might um, know that it will perdure over time, the animal doesn't, but maybe this makes for the, it for the animal worse again. So let's just um, not talk about these cases and just um, if there is something similar at stake and really similar, it's, um, it should be the same strength or force, etc., then they should count alike. Is, did this clarify? It clarified. Okay. In the question period, I will disagree. Okay, good. <laughs> we'll keep going. Vous argumentez plus loin parce que. Pardon? Vous, vous posez une argumentation plus loin parce que c'est quand même lourd de conséquences si vous dites là. Euh, pour pour l'exemple, non, c'est euh, la raison, c'est juste que euh, la, la raison est que c'est discriminatoire. Peut-être on peut en parler dans euh, dans la science des questions pour voir pourquoi vous avez un désaccord avec ça. Parce que c'est assez intéressant pour moi parce qu'en éthique animale, c'est un principe qui est très très accepté. Donc je suis très curieuse de savoir euh, ce que vous avez, avez à dire. Ok. Um, so, if unequal interests or claims are at stake, of course, priority should be given to the weightier one. So if you have, for example, someone suffering at the scale of eight, and someone at four, priority should be given to alleviate the suffering of eight. And um, claims, so morally protected interests, are uh, um, usually are more important than replaceable interests, or your preference interests. You have a preference for X, but your welfare doesn't really depend on having X. So just to uh, illustrate this, so we have on the left hand side wants, desire and preferences. They are morally um, less binding. You have in the middle claims and entitlements which are morally irrelevant insofar as they should be considered. And on the right hand side you have um, rights which are usually regarded as legally relevant. Let's now come to the case examples where you already might to start to disagree a lot with what I've been saying. So I'm going to consider factory farming, animal experimentation and animals living in the wild. And I will see whether vulnerability scores can add anything there. So, um, in the case of factory farming, we have a conflict between the claim of uh, humans to eat and the claims of animals not to suffer and, to, and the interest in continued existence. So the question is, is it um, ethically legitimate to eat animals and their products or are animals in factory farming a decreased risk of being wronged? I think it's useful to um, distinguish two scenarios. On the one hand side, we have scenarios in which the consumption of animal products is necessary for human survival. So in some region of the world, you really depend on animal products and um, so for survival. And in this case, you have a vital claim of humans versus a fundamental claim of animals um, that is not to suffer. And um, I think it's um, okay to give priority in this situation to the claims of humans. However, one might say, okay, this is clear in the case of using animal products, but about, about killing the animals. And um, so usually if you kill a being, here there, I mean, you're probably aware there's a lot of debate about the harm of death in philosophy, so I'm not going to go very deeply into that. Um, what I think about death is in a nutshell that it deprives a being of pleasant future experiences and um, the death is worse the more one is connected to 
his or her future. So um, if someone has already a lot of plans and objectives which then are uh, which then this person is not able to fulfill. I think the death in this case is worse than if a being has had less plans or has left had left time in the uh, life le left, etc. This is subject of debate, but I start from this assumption. So I think in such a scenario. Um, Given that humans are more connected to the future, uh, in many cases it can be justified to eat animals and their products, but of course this should be done in a way that uh, avoids unnecessary suffering. Um, now, in the second scenario, I think that's the one we most live in, it's there are alternatives to harmfully or painfully produced animal products. Um, in this case, I think eating animal products has the status of a mere preference. It's not a necessity or even a legitimate claim, like in scenario one. Um, it's not a morally protected interest, it's just a preference. However, the interest, the animal interest in the avoidance of suffering has the status of a fundamental claim. So in this situation, to give priority to the, to the human preference over the animal anim, over animals' claims would be an unjust consideration of the interests at stake. So this will mean that animals in factory farming, at least in our society, could be considered as particularly vulnerable group. They are often at increased likelihood of having their claims unjustly considered because they are and um, due to species prejudices. I come um, back at the end to what we should do about this. The second scenario is animal experimentation. Animal experimentation is a much debated domain, both by, from animal ethicist, researcher and the like. It is also the most frequent application domain of vulnerability discourse in contemporary um, bioethics when authors talk about animal vulnerability and it mostly reflects the views of vulnerability in the case of research with humans. Um, the difference with the scenario before is that on both sides fundamental claims seem to be in oppositions so um, the interest or the, the claim of humans to live healthy, long lives and the, the claims of animals to avoid suffering and to continued existence. So two arguments can be made. Um, the first argument is to say, well, animals have a claim to be only used in research that respects current uh, research standards or research requirement. And the assumption behind it is that um, research, how it is regulated nowadays in Western countries, um, satisfyingly fulfills um, or is a satisfying protection of, satisfactory protection of animals' interests. A second um, strand of the argument would be to say, well, these currently implemented research standards or research requirements are too low. Much higher standards are needed, similar to those used in research with humans. Um, with both arguments, some of the groups of animals can be modeled as vulnerable research subjects. And I will um, discuss both arguments step. By step. So even you might disagree about ha um, having higher research standards in the case of animal ethics, you might say, I think what um, legislation did now is fine, current protections are a good level, but even within this scenario some groups qualify as vulnerable and uh, as particularly vulnerable where special protection should be implemented. So let's start with the first strand of argument. So what are current research protections in animal um, research? 
So I list a few which are, um, if you look at different guidelines in different countries, which are the ones that are the most accepted mm -hmm. nearly by all countries. So it's the three R, which are reduce, replace, and refine. So reduce the number of animals, refine um, the methods, and re if you can replace the um, animals with other methods, with alternatives, then do so. Then a second criterion is social and scientific value. So research should contribute something new to, um, to us. Um, we should gain some new knowledge with it. And um, it should be socially useful. Then of course research should be scientifically valid. Um, that is, um, it should be methodologically sound and correct. And usually um, a final criterion that is often accepted is, or nearly always accepted is independent review. That means if you want to conduct animal research, um, it has to be uh, reviewed by animal ethics committees. Um, so the argument could go like this, the first argument. Um, animals more likely to be included in research does not respect these requirements can be considered as particularly vulnerable. Um, and I think this is the case of quite a few groups. So um, an example is animals involved in research with trivial goals like new um, cleaning uh, powders, um, cosmetics and the like, because here again there's no fair consideration of interest, trivial interest or uh, trivial preferences of humans are, giving pref are given preference over more important claims of animals. Uh, quite a topic um, that is quite important is that quite a few studies, if you look at systematics reviews, quite a few animal studies are methodologically not sound. So for example, too few animals are used to have um, a, a useful result or the methods are not described in a detailed enough way to reproduce the study and then to uh, duplicate it, replicate it. And I think in, in this case, uh, the interest of animals in the avoidance of suffering is not, has not been given at all fair interest because um, um, in this case, if the, the study is not sound, it was just no con basically no consideration has been given to the animals. And then um, another issue is that in some countries there might be biased members of animal ethics committees. That means um, some members of um, animal ethics committees might depend for the research, for their own research, on animal research. So they might have a bias towards animal research. And in this case, um, you could also ask the question whether they are really likely to, let's say, objectively evaluate the interests at stake or not. And another issue is um, there are um, animals who are also particularly vulnerable if you take this as premise. Um, are those who do not who are sentient but do not fall under animal welfare acts. So in the in the U.S. this is the case. Uh, I think of birds and, and rodents. They are just don't fall under this act at all. And the question is, what kind of consideration are they given? If they are not given any at all, then I think this is if you accept the direct duty rule is morally problematic. So animals more likely involved in studies that do not fulfill these points are um, at higher risk of being wronged and they can be considered as a particularly vulnerable research group. Now, um, you might say, I think in the domain of animal ethics, many people say that, well, anyway, the standards are way too low, we need higher standards. Even in this case, uh, what it would mean is of course that even more groups of animals are particularly vulnerable. So you could say, well, um, so one argument would be to say, well, animal research has to be guided by similar principles than 
research with humans. So, so we should expand it by, for example, fair subject selection, favorable harm-benefit ratio, consent, and the like. So if you look at fair subject selection, um, it's clear that animals usually carry all the burdens, while humans nearly always all the benefits, so this would not be a fair subject selection. Favorable risk-harm um, ratio falls a bit in the same category, because usually uh, the benefits are again mostly, if not exclusively, for humans and not for the animals. As for consent, you might be a bit surprised that I listed here. There are recent, um, I, I don't know whether you're aware, for example, of um, the work of Will Kimlick and Sue Donaldson with Zoopolis. They argue there that uh, some animals can utter their choices, they can have preferences and utter for it. And some people think this can also be applied to the case of animal research. So you can see whether an animal is assenting or dissenting. Is it interested in participating in research? Some animals, such as pigs or uh, monkeys, they might be inclined, for example, to come and play video games. They have a good day. And uh, on other days, if you see that they are not interested, you just leave them. So you accept these non-verbal clues. Um, so, as said again though, this is very often not taken into consideration. And if you think that this higher standard should be valid, then, um, then again, many animals um, qualify as particularly vulnerable groups. Um, yeah, I jump over this because now I see that we're running a bit ahead of the time. Um, so yeah, with both arguments, um, some groups of animals qualify as particularly vulnerable. In the first case, because current research standards are not met in the second one, because these re uh, research standards are criticized, criticized on the basis that they are insufficient, they are maybe biased towards humans and not taking seriously animals' interest into account. So in both cases they are particularly vulnerable. And um, as a remedy it would be similar than the one used in human research. So for example you would have to adopt the research protocol, lower the harm level, um, and sometimes um, so that it would be acceptable by consent by proxy. And in some cases, I think you should the, the, the study should not be conducted because they are ethically problematic. Now I would like to come to the last group, which might surprise you a bit, maybe. It's wild animals. So um, animal ethics have not talked about animals living in the wild for quite a long time. It's a quite recent topic to start to look at or to start to consider animals in the wild and their lives. And what is, um, by looking at the studies in biology, etc., uh, one can see that life in the wild is not as harmonious as animal ethicists often thought. So animals in the wild face quite some stress, for example, because they are victims of predation, sometimes hunger, diseases and parasites, etc. Also, of course, um, wild animals can be affected by environmental catastrophes, human-induced climate change, accident, etc. In some cases, humans could assist them. The question is, should we? And this is what I want to discuss in the following. So I'm going to base myself on uh, uh, thoughts experiments uh, presented by John Hadley. John Hadley um, imagines in his uh, first scenario the aftermath of a natural catastrophe. So imagine a tsunami or an earthquake, etc. And humans are the victims. And usually we start, we think that we have a duty to help these humans, even if we did not have any relationship with them before. If you're not hardcore, right libertarian, then it doesn't work. 
So, um, most moral theories think that uh, we have a duty to help if it's possible from a logistics point of view, if it does not come at too high cost, and if we don't put um, other humans at risk. In a second scenario, Hadley um, imagines the same scenario, but it involves wild animals. And he's arguing that if similar interests are at stake, so the interest in non-suffering, etc., then yes, we should also assess these animals if we can do it under this concession, if we want to avoid a discrimination based on species. Now we might um, object and say, well, no, um, what we protect in the case of humans is rationality, that they can anticipate that they are going to die in agony, etc. For this reason, um, Hadley uh, suggested a third scenario, which is the same again, we are in the aftermath after some catastrophe, but the victims in this case are um, mentally handicapped humans who have, for example, who are living in a um, hospital or so, and they have, uh, for the sake of the argument, they don't have any relations with other humans. And usually we would say intuitively, yes, of course we have a duty to help in this case. And we usually think, well, okay, and this shows that it's not rationality and uh, cognitive capacities we care about, but rather the capacity uh, to, to feel, etc. So, very often we could consider wild animals' interests, for example, uh, in the aftermath of forest fires, etc., or floodings, but we fail to do so. Um, I think if we take anti speciesism seriously, suffering in the wild is justified only if we are keeping um, some, if we consider the interests, we make um, a conscious thought process. Uh, conscious thought process about whether we should help them or not, but we then decide to, to give priorities to other beings. Um, I have a few objections to this, but I see the time's a bit running, so maybe we can come... Yeah, but we start late, so we can... Oh, it's okay. Okay. So just... Um, yeah, that could work. So maybe a um, first... Um, Objection is to say, well, um, in the one case, humans were uh, made worse off, but uh, animals were always worse off when living in the wild. But you wouldn't say that if two human populations were concerned. So again, if one is living a very bad life and another population a very good one, and then the good one um, is victim of a catastrophe, they don't have a stronger claim to assistance than the ones that has always been living in a bad state. Um, so about, we could also say, well, okay, um, but there's a different potential for well-being. Um, life in the wild was always probably not as nice, but again, um, I think that um, it should be, well-being should be measured by some ideal state that could be achieved and not the actual state. And um, what, what is probably the most frequent objection is, well, um, do animals not have a claim for non-interference, that they would prefer that we keep out of their business? I think often this is the case, but I don't think it is in their, in, in their interest that their interests are not considered. If it can be beneficial for them, I don't see why they would have, why it would be in their interest to have a claim for non-interference. So, but of course humans have interfered in nature and have a quite bad, re bad track record about this. So, of course, animals should not be made more vulnerable by human um, intervention. I think for the moment maybe more research is needed to see where and in what ways human could benefit wild animals. It, I also have to add that um, interventions in the wild are done quite often. For example, animals are vaccinated, um, sometimes fed during harsh winters and the like. But I think um, there has not been a lot of systematic thoughts about why 
we do it, when should we do it, what would the long-term consequence be, etc. Whether we should really do it from a moral point of view and the like. Um, so if we could take animals' interests into fair account but fail to do so, I think they also qualify as particularly vulnerable group. So now I, say, I, I showed that vulnerability discourse helps us to identify some, as in the case of humans, some animals groups that are at increased risk of having their legitimate claims unjustly considered or not considered at all. Um, and um, so more um, attention is needed when we made a claim, for example, in animal ethics. This would then be the task, for example, of animal ethics committees. But it would also, if we want to remedy vulnerability or reduce vulnerability, in some cases, a change of attitudes of humans is needed. Um, sometimes even in the case of policy makers, as in the case of factory farming, but also in the case of wild animals. Okay, let's now wrap up. So I showed you how this, how the vulnerability discourse as it is used in bioethics could be made fruitful for animal ethics, but let's now look at the basic terms and see whether we see a bit clear. So sentience is usually seen as um, the capacity to feel, to experience, and is usually regarded as sufficient reason for moral status. As I said in the very beginning of my talk, invulnerability is seen as the in, uh, incapacity to be harmed or wronged or to be uh, negatively affected. Um, a lot of the literature very closely link vulnerability and dependency. I think this is problematic or even wrong. Um, dependency may lead to increased vulnerability, but not necessarily so. In many stages of our lives, we are dependent on others. This is not morally problem problematic as long as your interests are fairly taken in account by the other person. I think the paradigmatic example would be parenthood and children relationships. So, um, if you go beyond, uh, away from vulnerability in everyday language and in ecology, I think um, vulnerability presupposes sentiment, sentience but goes beyond embodiment. Um, so vulnerable individuals are individuals with certain classes of interest, that means they can be harmed, wrong, exploited, injured, humiliated, and the, li the like. And not all, as I said in the beginning also, not all of these acts um, necessarily need lead to any mental or physical harms, that is when the notion mere wrongs comes into play. So, um, Secretly reading your partner's or colleague's emails um, is an example of a wrong that doesn't involve any harm. Stalking without being without the person who is stalked um, seeing or experiencing this is another example. Um, I leave it open um, here that this uh, this is the case of animals. If you're interested, I, I think if uh, so, I, I presented an interest based account. If there is no interest, then you cannot be wronged. So, I think I wrote the paper about this. So, I think um, many of these categories cannot be fulfilled by animals. The only exception is um, if it's uh, if it increases species' prejudices. And vulnerability again helps us to identify those, uh, to point out, to draw our attention to those groups who are more likely uh, to be unjustifiably harmed. So they should receive um, special protection so that they receive what they are factually due. So let me conclude. Um, we started with the fact that we needed a definition of vulnerability that resolves the problem of disparate views, 
in the literature and um, also avoids the pitfall of formal definitions and allows us the identification of vulnerable groups or particularly vulnerable groups. Um, in the definition proposed, vulnerability is determined by the possession of welfare and agency interests. Everyone is, according to this view, vulnerable, but some are more likely to unjustifiably manifest their vulnerability. Um, as in the case of humans, some groups of animals can be framed as particularly vulnerable. And now you might wonder, well, what does this really add to the animal ethics literature? Well, first of all, it helps to distinguish morally justified from morally unjustified forms of harm. It can point us towards those individuals in need of special protection. As I showed, many groups could fall or are falling into this category. And what, um, to remedy this, we need to change sometimes our attitudes towards animals, um, recognize uh, their value, and sometimes compensate them maybe for past wrongs. This is a topic on its own. Um, and um, yeah, recognize that they have basic claims that need consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your topic. I have a few questions. I wonder in which framework are your arguments embedded in exactly? Mm -hmm. For instance, in which ethical framework? Because mm -hmm. I have this feeling that vulnerability can be a very nice keyword to speak mm -hmm. about, for instance, uh, utilitarianism, but mm -hmm. also maybe car ethics or even some mm. maybe human approach yeah. using the fact that empathy is very important yeah. to take care of uh, vulnerable uh, animals or people. So I, I, I think, I think that, that that can be interesting because implicitly I have that feeling that you adopted a very utilitarian approach, uh, meaning that you have to uh, minimize uh, harm, for instance, uh, but sometimes I also have the feeling there are maybe some other consideration hidden. So it can be very useful. And so also my, my other question, which can be related, is that yeah, I was a bit surprised that you defend the strict equality between yeah. interests. Because you know, mm. I think I'm vegetarian and I, I really care about animals, but yeah. a lot of people say you don't have to cause harm, which is not necessary. Yeah. And this is weaker than saying uh, the harm of an animal. Uh, Let's say, for instance, if I can play the devil advocate, uh, ants is strictly equal to the, the arm of human. I will be honest, I will never kill uh, some human body uh, <laughs> if I have to choose between a human or animals. And I think this is moral in some way, but maybe I'm mm -hmm. not, so I can just uh, admit it. But maybe we, we can use utilitarian and also some other frameworks and mix them in some way just to, to, to admit that uh, as a human being we can care of human uh, a bit more sometimes you know, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. just a, a suggestion so i just that. okay hmm. uh yeah regarding the first question i think or my hope was that it's compatible with different frameworks because maybe i have to say a bit more about the background so um I, I did this um, a lot. I worked a lot about on this during my PhD, which was embedded in a medical ethics project in a medical faculty. And there, it's really about what is vulnerability. How can we help vulnerable patients, vulnerable research subjects, and the like? And you want to get away from theory because you really have practical questions, and then you don't want an answer. And people say, "Well, I'm I'm utilitarian. I cannot accept it." Or people say, oh, "I'm a deontologist. I cannot accept it." So what I tried to make is um, to have something that hopefully is more or less compatible with both sides. You said um, vulnerability uh, may be linked a lot with uh, ethics of care, uh, human ethics. I agree, I think um, especially ethics of care, especially in the French tradition, use the notion a lot. I think they don't really def um, define it very well often. 
or properly. So it's more used as a, as a key term, like you drop vulnerability. I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be a bit. I think dignity also has the no, same. You can. Mm -hmm. Sorry? You can, you can give us your So it has sometimes in some debates like this, this force, like it's not this discourse, like dignity mm -hmm. or, and um, I think to avoid that, so that the notion still can fulfill its role, we need to take it seriously and see what, what does it really add, does it add as much? So, um, yeah, I think there's not really a, an, eth an ethical framework behind some really use it, some ethical frameworks really use it. I sometimes disagree about how they do that. I hope it's compatible with, and I, you, you said you heard some utilitarian tendencies. <laughs> yeah, I think that might be true. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you can get out of your skin. And then um, equality of interests. Um, yeah, I, this is good because I have to, I, for a long time I really accepted this, and I recently started to struggle with it. And I was like, it goes sometimes. I, I think I agree with the basic um, premises, like you should not discriminate based on morally irrelevant features. But then I think um, in some situations it, it can become more complicated. So for example, I so this is the project you mentioned. So I got a big grant to start a big uh, a project on positive duties towards animals. And uh, what we should do if duties towards humans and animals conflict and on the political representation of animals. And if we take, um, I mean, animals just outnumber us. And of course, I mean, if you're well acquainted with utilitarianism, you can see where this goes. Um, you might have, uh, and this is what is called the problematic conclusion in the literature by Peter Valentine, uh, etc. So, uh, do we have to shift all our resources away from animals? And this seems extremely counterintuitive. And um, so if equal interests count the life, we just have a numbers problem. So I started to struggle a bit, but I think I'm still very um, co uh, yeah, convinced by the main message. You said, you said in your uh, comment, well, you would never, if it's about a dilemma situation, you would, but you would never kill a human. I think I think most animal ethicists would would agree that this is uh, fine. I mean, then you have some maybe not explainable psychological ties to you, or even explainable psychological ties. So I don't think this this is in contradiction with the principle of equal consideration necessarily. Though, or what would you? Why would you think it's? in contradiction because I mean you can say well I have tied emotional ties it would make me more miserable and then your utilitarian calculus is clearly pointing towards one direction. No my, my, my point just answer was that if we use the vulnerability in, yeah. a, fr in a human framework for instance we can mm -hmm. avoid this problem saying that we can pay more attention to uh, people who are closer and also to our species in some way. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't take account of uh, the arm of animal in some way, but just that um, pragmatically in some uh, bar. No, I'm not sure it's totally, uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's easy to defend, but maybe we can add like a utility function mm -hmm. which can be applied in some way, uh, but the way we, you give to uh, the, uh, the arm can be uh, can change in function of who is going to decide. For instance, if the one who decides uh, is a human, it will, it, will, it will be ethical for him to defend human. And the same way, if an animal defends his uh, uh, own family, it can be ethical also in some way. So just, uh, just to, to, to indicate, I, 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 I'm not going to give an answer to that in this question, it's very difficult. Just to indicate that maybe you can use vulnerability uh, in another framework, which will avoid this problem and maybe create some other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would. I would be a bit hesitant to 
I mean, then you would clearly say that like um, <coughs> any relationships do probably matter, but I wouldn't say. Well, I think you more want to point to dependency. No, people dependent on you maybe have special claims, but not vulnerable people. I don't see how you want to use that to justify. I don't see how you want to uh, use vulnerability in a moral, let's say, objective way to justify coming to your conclusion. Mm. No, it's just to say that uh, vulnerability is very important because uh, because of empathy, you have to take care of these kinds of people or animals. So for instance, you recognize that animals are vulnerable in some way, so you cannot exploit them to eat them and so on. So it's a trigger of empathy. And yeah, it's yeah, empathy yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is, yeah, this for you, is, the, this is empathy that that gives you the moral. Yeah, 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 this is the idea. I'm not sure I totally so it's not this, the but, uh, yeah. I, I just suggest, you know, so, so it would be, yeah, vulnerability is a clue that you have to exercise yeah. your empathy, you know, that would be the, the path. It's a salient <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Yeah, something like this. But I, I'm not sure I defend it, but I think yeah. it can but have some good aspects. I think, I, th I think this is, um, one of the uses in the ethics of, of care, I think, that you have this automatic response, mm -hmm. but then the issue is like, what to do if people don't have this immediate empathic response? So I'm a bit um, reluctant to use like human frameworks, etc., for, for this reason, because I think it just might not work for everyone while ra rationalist ethical theories they do. But this is maybe just my background. But thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oui, moi j'avais une question, euh, parce que vous avez un petit comprendre le français, je suis désolé d'être en français. Ben, J'ai une question qui va exactement dans le même sens. Moi je pense que le, la, la problématique de légale considération conduit à des contrasens. En fait, euh, toute votre argumentation, bah, par exemple pour l'expérimentation, oui. je ne suis pas du tout convaincant. Ouais. Ben, vous, êtes, vous êtes clairement dans, dans, dans l'expérimentation. Or, le, en Belgique, on a des lois très très strictes de protection d'animaux. En Suisse aussi, mais enfin, on est en Belgique, je ne connais pas la législation suisse. Hein. Donc, si vous voulez, mais, mais, mais donc, si vous voulez, je, je me place dans une perspective de protection de l'animal au maximum. Mais on peut, on peut nier le fait que dans l'expérimentation, on n'est pas dans une égale considération. Non, dire, pas du bon, tout. Ben, et, et, et vous cherchez des systèmes pour essayer de faire croire que, mais, mais dans les faits, je, je pense non. que c'est l'égale considération qui, qui me semble difficilement défendable. Parce que ça, 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 ça conduit à des... À, à, ou en tout cas, difficilement à mettre en œuvre. Vous, êtes, vous conduisez une voiture, il y a un enfant au milieu de la route. Pour l'éviter, vous dépassez sur le trottoir, il y a un chien. Je vous en, en, en égale considération, vous demandez ce que vous faites. Je vous espère que vous n'hésitez pas. Voilà. Je pense que l'égale considération est, est, est inapplicable. Alors, dans certaines situations, on peut faire croire que c'est applicable, mais je pense que trop, ça conduit à des contresens terribles. Quand je dis c'est un chien, les gens hésitent. Si je dis que c'est un crapaud, on n'hésite plus. Qu'est-ce qu'on qu qu sait, qu qu sait, qu sait de la conscience d'un crapaud Qu'est-ce qu'on sait de la conscience d'un crapaud Une grenouille. Frog. Qu'est-ce qu'on sait de la conscience d'un crapaud Qu'est-ce qu'on sait de la souffrance d'un crapaud et, 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 et donc, moi, euh, bah, sur ce plan, autant... Euh, je, suis, je participe à ce séminaire. <rire> Donc, autant je suis preneur d'une prise en compte de, de éthique de l'animal, autant je pense que c'est illusoire de, de croire qu'on puisse évi é, é, éviter une sorte de hiérarchisation. Ouais, en tout cas, les, la hiérarchisation a la grosse, le gros avantage de clarifier les choses et d'être très cohérente. La, la hiérarchisation ouais. est beaucoup plus claire. Bon, c'est évident, je, je n'accorde pas la même considération à un crapaud qu'à un enfant. C'est très clair. Je suis spéciste et je l'assume. Euh, mais, mais, mais il n'empêche que je me bats pour qu'on respecte les crapauds. Ouais, bon. Euh, <rire> ouais, il y a beaucoup à dire. Oui, bien sûr. Euh, bon, tout d'abord, est-ce qu'il y a. Pour votre, je pense, votre expérience de pensée entre l'agrumie et l'enfant. Euh, vous n'êtes pas sur le même niveau, on a 
bien d'accord. Parce que... Et donc, c'est pas d'égale considération Non, bah, vous pouvez donner la prise, euh, même avec l'égale considération. Je pense, euh, bon, je ne suis pas expert sur la vie mentale des, des grenouilles, mais euh, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup moins de, de planification vers le futur, etc. Et puis, bien sûr, pour l'enfant, il y a toutes ces gens autour, etc. Donc, on n'est même pas du tout dans le même scénario. Puis là, pour, pour l'expérimentation, euh, revenons dans... Oui, vous dites que vous avez des lois... Bon, oui, je suis d'accord. Si on applique bien le principe des considérations, je pense qu'il euh, faut arrêter avec la plupart d'expériences qui mènent à la souffrance. Là, je suis très d'accord et je pense que ça sera la conséquence. Euh, moi, perso, je n'ai pas de problème avec ça. Je pense qu'il y a toujours d'utilisation d'animaux qui sont permissibles, c'est seulement des, des utilisations où... Euh, c'est minimalement invasif. Euh, non, mais écoutez, pourquoi l'expérimentation animale On pourrait faire une expérimentation sur l'homme tout de suite. Hein? Oui, voilà. Oui, mais donc ça montre bien que, que l'expérimentation animale ne se défend que dans un contexte d'inégal considération. Oui, ben, je suis d'accord. Ouais, bon, alors, euh, je, donc, je, je pense que. Si, si vous... Mais ça, c'est pas vrai, Bernard. Bon, non. Peter Singer, il défend l'égal considération. Et il dit quand même qu'on peut faire certaines expériences. Oui, mais c'est très, très... Genre, on n'a pas le génie d'accord avec Petit Non, mais ce que, 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 que je veux dire, c'est que ce n'est pas l'égale considération. Tu, tu, tu attaques un épouvantail. Euh, ce n'est pas, pas à cause de raisonnement d'égale considération qu'on refuse ou non l'expérience scientifique euh, sur les animaux. Il euh, y a des gens qui croient à l'égale considération, qui vont quand même justifier euh, l'expérience scientifique dans certaines circonstances, si le calcul, bla 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 bla. Euh, dans, vo dans votre euh, façon d'argumenter, qui était très utilitariste malgré tout, euh, parce que vous parlez des intérêts, hein, vous, con vous construisez la base sur les intérêts, ben, j'imagine si on faisait notre, notre, euh, notre considération d'intérêt à la fin, peut-être qu'on arrivera à que certaines expériences sont justifiées. Je, je pense quelques hommes, mais... Peut-être pas beaucoup, mais... Pas beaucoup. Mais je pense, parce, parce que ça, c'est une des tendances en éthique animale les, les dernières années. Les abolitionnistes, ils ont dit qu'aucune expérimentation, aucun contact des humains avec les animaux est moralement permissible. Mais là, je, je pense quelques usages qui sont non invasifs, qui ne créent pas des douleurs, etc., peuvent être permissibles. Après, euh, ouais, donc, euh, je, je pense... Euh, ce qui est intéressant dans le discours de, de la vulnérabilité et euh, l'expérimentation, c'est que euh, ce discours de la, sur la vulnérabilité des sujets de recherche vient de, des expériences que, avec des humains qu'on dirait qu sont, qui ont été faits, mais où on voit que c'est vraiment problématique. Donc, un premier, premier exemple est. Euh, je pense Albert Neisser qui a fait des, euh, des expériences avec des, des jeunes prostituées. Euh, et là, c'était un groupe, c'est vraiment des, des enfants. Ça, on dirait clairement que c'est un groupe vulnérable, ils ne sont pas capables de donner leur consentement, etc. Et puis un autre exemple, c'est euh, l'expérimentation euh, dans les années 70, euh, ta, euh, appelée Tuskegee, où euh, euh, des... des euh, des Noirs euh, aux États-Unis, ils n'ont pas été euh, informés qu'ils participent dans des études. Et là, on dans les voit... prisons aussi. Pardon Dans les prisons aussi. Ouais. Oui, il y a énormément d'exemples. Voilà. Et là, je, je, c'est cette utilisation d'où de, 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 vient ce concept de la vulnérabilité. Je, je, moi, je pense que c'est quand même une force de. Je, je vois, parce que là, on, on, on voit que le critère n'est pas euh, est-ce que la personne est rationnelle dans le cas des enfants, etc. La question est est-ce qu'on traite euh, un être sensible de cette façon ou pas Je pense que cette question peut se poser dans le cadre de l'expérimentation animale. Parce que vous partez de, du présupposé. Que, là, je pense historiquement, on est souvent parti du présupposé qu'on peut le faire, mais on veut. Euh, on peut quand même euh, se poser la question si ça c'est... Euh, mais je, je, je ne reviens pas à question de la question. Je dis que ça est vraiment... La, la solution de dire l'égal considération me paraît difficilement défendable. 
parce que l'école considération est, 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 est mais, pratiquement non, 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 non. Vous ne oui, pouvez non, faire que des exceptions. Mais, écoutez, oui, bon, vous avez bien sûr votre expérience de penser avec la, la voiture électronique qui doit choisir s'il va, va tuer l'enfant. Ce n'est pas que de penser, hein, c'est des expériences très oui. concrètes. Mais dans l'expérimentation animale, on n'est pas du tout dans, dans la même situation, hein, parce que qu'est-ce qui... Il n'y a pas sauvé la vie d'un humain, euh, tu es un animal. Ah, bien sûr que si, dans dans l'expérimentation animale, on fait bien là-dedans. Mais la question d'expérimentation animale, pourquoi on fait l'expérimentation animale Si on fait, fait l'expérimentation sur l'humain, bah, ça, 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 ça y est, ça y est, beaucoup plus vite. Hein. Non, écoutez, on prolonge la vie, on améliore la qualité de vie, mais pour le moment, on sauve très rarement des vies. On les prolonge, parce que tout, pour le moment, on est tous encore mortels. Hein. Euh, donc, je, oui, on, on, peut-être quelques personnes peuvent vivre plus longtemps, plus, euh, plus sainement, euh, dans, dans un meilleur état de santé, mais je ne dirais pas qu'on est dans la même logique. Non, si, parce que je veux dire que bon, non, l'argument, c'est de dire, au fond, les animaux soumis à expérimentation, bah, quelque part, pour faire en sorte qu'ils ne, qu'ils ne souffrent pas, ils sont tout à fait condamnés. Pardon, Donc, ça, je pas ils, sont, ils sont condamnés. On sacrifie des animaux. Hein, Mm-hmm. Pour, pour essayer de faire avancer là. Donc là, il y a, il y a clairement, dans, dans, dans le projet lui-même, il y a une, une inégale considération. Oui, je suis d'accord. Hein? Donc essayer de sauver le projet non, en, en se référant à l'égale considération, moi ça me paraît. Ça non, mais moi je n'essaie pas de sauver le projet de l'expérimentation animale. Hein? <rire> c'est, c'est pas du tout. Euh... Moi je veux juste que. Dans, euh, moi, c'est des, des différents types d'argumentation que j'ai évoquées. Je suis absolument d'accord que si on prend euh, l'égale considération en compte, euh, il, y a beau, presque, euh, il y a très peu d'expériences qui sont permis. On peut aussi euh, on peut s'imaginer quelques expériences qui sont non nuisibles qui, euh, ou qui sont en bénéfice de, du groupe des animaux ou des animaux qui sont déjà malades, etc. Et, moi, ce que perso, ce que je crois, moi je suis plutôt du côté du deuxième argument, je pense qu'il faut vraiment rendre... Vous avez dit, oui, la Belgique a des bonnes lois, la Suisse aussi, mais je pense que c'est vraiment pas suffisant, parce que c'est toujours, on part toujours du principe que les animaux sont là pour être utilisés dans l'expérimentation. Je pense qu'il faut vraiment... Euh, higher standards, et puis adapter des standards qui sont assez similaires à ceux qui sont utilisés dans la recherche avec les humains, des groupes de vulnérables d'humains. Et puis là, on verra que euh, il y aura, je pense, euh, vous êtes permis, on peut faire, s'il y a un, un FX review, on peut faire euh, des expériences avec des enfants, des, des personnes incapables de consentement, mais seulement si c'est dans leur intérêt, etc. Je pense qu'on euh, peut raisonner de la même façon dans le cadre de l'expérimentation animale. Mais parce que c'est, c'est pas seul, enfin non, c'est, c'est pas seul l'objectif de l'expérimentation animale. Non, c'est mais évident, non, je, je que l'expérimentation l'objectif. animale pour le bien-être de l'animal, ça ne pose aucun problème ouais. à personne. On ne pose pas la même question. Oui, oui, mais ça va. Oui, écoutez, j'arrête là. Oui, Oui, j'ai une question sur la différence entre euh, les deux types d'intérêts que tu as introduits. Euh, Ah, oui. The welfare, uh, interest and agency interest. Intérêt euh, de bien-être et euh, intérêt du groupe, j'imagine. Je voulais savoir s'il y avait une une différence, si on apportait une enfin, si on accordait une valeur supérieure à l'une, à l'un ah, ou ouais, à l'autre. Ouais. Euh... Bon, je pense. Euh... Ouais, je, je, ça rejoint un peu, c'est bien. Parce que, ok, bon, je pense qu'il y a beaucoup d'animaux qui ont juste des euh, intérêt, mais pas agency. Si tu as posé des questions en français, mais tu okay, peux okay, pas non, non, c'est bien, c'est juste. Non, 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 non. <rire> ok. Um, je pense, si, si, si tu as un conflit entre, euh, euh, ok, on a deux, deux êtres et les deux ont le même euh, welfare interest. Et là, euh, il, faut, euh, il faut donner la priorité à, ce, à celui où c'est plus grave. Après, si un, euh, donc on a de nouveau, imaginons que maintenant on a deux êtres, ils sont le même 
welfare interest qui sera frustré, mais alors en plus son agency, uh, in, uh, agency interest, je pense que ça ajoute quelque chose. Mais sinon, il n'y a pas d'hierarchie, ah, je bien. pense. Mais je pense que ça ajoute quelque chose parce que cet être peut se, se voir dans l'avenir, etc. Donc, je trouve que ça ajoute euh, ou à des plans qui sera frustré. Je pense que ça peut, dans quelques circonstances, ajouter quelque chose. Et du coup, la mesure du dommage ou du préjudice, il est fait sur euh, le type d'intérêt, il est mesuré par rapport au type d'intérêt qui, oui, euh, qui, qui sera est, frustré. Qui est, oui, c'est ça. Euh, ouais. Parce qu'à un moment donné, tu parles d'equal harm. De quoi Equal harm. Euh, je ne sais, sais pas si vous parlez en anglais ou en français. Mais tu disais que euh, euh, finalement, à partir du moment où euh, deux individus ont un, ont un dommage égal, il fallait qu'ils euh, qu aient un, une considération égale. Et en fait, je me demandais dans quelle mesure ça se traduisait en termes d'intérêt et d'intérêt de, de nature différente. Si, euh, Mais tu viens de me répondre. Ouais, ah, si si c'est le même, euh, je pense qu'il y a alors normalement le même, même intérêt à la base. Mm -hmm. Je dirais. Ouais. I was wondering about uh, the meaning of uh, vulnerability in ordinary language. And oh, yeah. It seems to me that you can use it when, uh, for example, you can say that your enemy is vulnerable. So I was surprised that you, say, you said that something is vulnerable when you value it. Yeah, yeah, good. And I had to no, no, it's good. I think there are a few exceptions in everyday language, but it's not um, used in the same way as technical term okay. in, in, okay. in bioethics. So you can be vulnerable to excitement, falling in love, etc. Yes. And uh, these are not uh, usually not negatively perceived. Or if your uh, enemy is vulnerable to attack, I, I agree that this is usually. Uh, perceived as something positive. I think though that in the case of uh, in, in bioethics, humanitarian aid, it's uh, more regarded as something you wish to, to avoid. But I agree that in yeah, everyday yeah, language yeah. there are a few um, exceptions. Yes, okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, so, uh, I like your, your operationalization of the concept of uh, vulnerability and uh, based on a disposition, based on, on interest. Because it, if you are in a utilitarian framework, automatically this concept has some, some effect on moral, moral decision. But if you are, you know, like course guard, or mm -hmm. yeah, if you are, uh, the ground of, of ethics is not interest. Mm. But interests are important even in for Kentian because you recognize the interest of the animals even if the animal is not rational. Mm. And it's part of the of the of the of the process to make a decision to care for them. So how would you is there a possibility to extend your definition to still be valid yeah. in a, a strongly Kentian framework? Thanks. That's good. Yeah, um, I, I think, so I talked about um, legitimate or valid claims and you could say, well, some legitimate claims have the status of, of right. So I used the, the language of, of claims, or uh, which comes from Hofeld, mm -hmm. where, where it, it, it's used to designate some claim right. And you could say, well, some claims are inviolable. You're not allowed to sacrifice some claims for the sake of others. And then I think you would have to determine which one mm -hmm. th these are. And I think I, I, I think you could come up with with a few like the the claim in continued existence uh, in bodily integrity and the like. I, I think it would be doable. The question is, okay, so if what I, the yeah. consequences be so appealing? 
And so if I understand you correctly, just yeah. to be precise. So you're saying you could shift your definition that the disposition is the defining term of interest, but in terms of the kind of claims, because we can make certain kind of claims based not on interest, but some rights or some other, you would just transfer it. You, we could identify the more vulnerable individuals those more likely to okay. have their rights unjustly considered. I, I'm not, yeah, I think the term, I think the term would lose, if, if you talk about rights as, uh, yeah, rights, of, this is, uh, do you, I, I think you might lose a bit something because first of all you have to define what is all the right and sometimes we care especially in the domain of health by healthcare ethics medical ethics you, you care you care about more than just rights i think you have also like a uh, claim for example to give yeah, you have a claim for being respectfully treated mm -hmm. as a medical patient do you have a right but I think this is something that should be fairly considered. You have a claim for social belonging. Is this really a right? So I think it would lose a bit of nuance. So you, will have, you would have to determine which this section of inviolable rights are. I think it would be some, some, some claims I discussed. But then you would get the issue with other and with prioritizing. Yeah, you wouldn't then be allowed to prioritize. Yeah. Like push? Yeah. Okay. So, so now you transform my questions in a in a in not in postcard but in a, the the case for animal rights. Yeah, the Reagan exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you push you 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 re reframe the Kantian base of, of ethics on rights, and of course you can extend rights to animals and it's okay. It's okay, but this is not what. Well, this is, I, I'm always really puzzled about this extension of rights to animals because why not be a utilitarianism? It seems that it's not doing much more than what you would do in terms of interest. On the other hand, if you are a strong Kantian, like Coast Guard, mm. so you're saying, no, no, it's not a question of rights, it's a question of rationality. Are you an agent? Mm -hmm. Of course, and, but we still want to care about animals because they have interests and we recognize in them some kind of quasi agency. Of course, they well, are not agent. We, yeah, but postcards' argument is that what we um, value in ourselves. Sorry, I, I read postcard a long time ago, so I She just published a new yeah, book. Yeah, I was talking about the book last year. Of the oh. last year book. I yeah, I haven't this. read it yet, so, yeah. so so I cannot say what she. But and just to remember her former arguments, it was um, well, what we value in ourselves as uh, Zwecki is is not as fine as final ends is not uh, only rationality but also our animality is this right, and this we share, and we should also value this in other animals. Th that's it, no? Yeah. It, uh, I have in the new book, it's, it's, it's a, a bit, bit more than yeah. No, but it's it's what we value in animals. It's the fact that we see in them that they have interest, but no, we don't value that they have interest. We value that if they were agent, they would recognize us. But we are since they cannot because they are animals. So as an agent, I recognize the quasi agency of someone else. Same thing with children. Mm -hmm. I reckon I, I I respect children because I recognize in them the quasi agency. Or she doesn't use the word quasi agency; it's much more convoluted. But but it's something like that. It's not equality. It's not equality. <laughs> it, it's not the point. It's why the, the principle of principle of equality is really well in the, in a singer framework. Mm. But it's much more difficult to argue in a Kantian framework, mm -hmm. except if you push to equal rights, which mm -hmm. is exactly yeah, the same, which is exactly yeah. the same, which is, people would say, why not be a better singer? You know, it's the same. It's the same conclusion, the same, almost the same. But still, I, I, would, I would think that someone, a Kantian, would, would see as 
group of animals are more vulnerable than others, so they would frame the thing differently. It seems yeah. to me that they would they would operationalize this 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 disposition that you identify in a certain way. And I'm just puzzled since I never thought about that before your talk, but they would say something about vulner vulnerability too, I suppose. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, so I, I have, unfortunately I haven't read the course card book, so I don't want to go too much. Anyway, I'm not on, an edition, so you, when you will read it, you will explain it to me. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, you really have to take course guard as an example because it wouldn't because Kant has this indirect duty which I don't want to accept. So she dislikes um, it too. Hmm? She dislikes it too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and um, so, how as a Kantian would you be able to identify or to see increased vulnerability? Yeah, it's an interesting. Uh, I always, you know, I've been working a long time about this, but I haven't. But even in the case of humans, what would you say? In the case of humans, humans just I think, uh, I think in many cases, as it's now done, I think it's often quite intuitive. But what you should be doing is you should for uh, in certain situations. I mean, for example, allocating uh, humanitarian aid aiding different refugees group, uh, healthcare, you should, uh, what you should do is identify the basic claims and see where something potentially could go wrong, where your pre biases, prejudices uh, might come in or where you might overlook something important for a group, for example the fact that some group is an alphabet and cannot navigate it, so you might have to anticipate a bit um, what could possibly go, go wrong and um, identify and find the claims that might be disrespected and then um, find a way to uh, protect this claim. So for example, if a group is an alphabet, provide them with an interpreter. So, but I, I want to come back to this, uh, yeah, how would you as a Kantian, I, I really cannot say. I, I think I have to think about this way more. Um, my, my, my first guess would be something like, I can identify the agents that are more susceptible to have the reciprocity principle violated. Something like that. No, no, I, no. no? Uh, may, no maybe, no. yeah, but this is the so part yes. I don't know, but maybe who are more likely to be used uh, as a mere yeah, means I mean. to an end. Maybe, but then I, again, the, I think this is way too restricted because this, this works in some situation. I mean, in medical care, so in medical research, you might come, yeah, a lot of groups were solely used as a means to an end, but you have other groups where there is, they are not used as a means to an end, but it's still an ethical. Uh, problem because maybe they are not aware, they are consenting, they're, they're autonomous, but they, uh, but there might be other issues with this group. So I think this would be a bit too restricted. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I, I'm also not sure. So um, I'm also not sure whether this project we are currently <laughs> pursuing in a dialogue is really useful. I mean, yeah. Um, as I said in the very beginning, um, yeah, I think the question is interesting, but um, as vulnerability discourse is used now, you want to get a bit away from these moral theories, because as you see, it really complicates things if you have to find an agreement on the, the moral rationales in the background. So, but sure, I, but if you don't go there, you will never convince people like Perna. <laughs> no, no, but that, that yeah, yeah. for practical reasons, yeah, it's I in see. your interest to have an answer for the Kent, to the Kantian. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but are you sure that uh, someone the the ethic of rights is so close to utilitarianism? Because to me, it's something like you have the a, an agent, a rational agent, have a duty not to violate someone else's right, but it's different from uh, like uh, calculating uh, 
well being. I don't see how. I know, but how the, you're right, it's different. But in, when they extend it to the animals, what is the, the funny part is that the animals are not agents. They have rights, but no duty. Yes, but, so, so, but so you have the duty not to violate their rights. Yeah. But you don't need, I don't know. Maybe I don't yeah, have it makes uh, yeah, I think I think you can cover a lot with a mean, at least in the animal research, using as a mere means to mm -hmm. an end. But then the question is again, well, what do you, why should you not do that in the case of animals? Because it's not according to Korsgaard, the part, the bits I read. It's n because we are not only valuing rationality, mm -hmm. we are also valuing. Um, um, our animality, which is a substantial part of that, so, so we should also um, respect this in, in others. But I think it would still not be able to account for everything. I think it works in some cases. Well, maybe it would. I have to think it through, actually. Means to an end, whether this would account for all... No, it wouldn't. I don't think so. That is interesting. Maybe passionate. But to, to answer you, there's a difference you write about, for example, case of predation. Jesus. Predation. So you, the stress when you talk about predation, you know, for, from pure utilitarianism point of view, it's it's a big question. You have to yeah. answer yourself. Should but we allow it's predation? And you know, for for a right, yeah, you, know, it's not you know, they are not agents, so they cannot buy it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's the difference. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I push I mean, a little bit too it, much. Uh, no, no, it's interesting. I found it very interesting. It, it works for some groups. I mean, research is really also using animals for food. I think it doesn't work in the wild at all. And I think these authors probably look at it as an advantage of their theory. I mean, mm. this, this argument used to be a um, reduction ad absurdum for a long time. It's only recently that authors were like, well, I mean, you find it even in Nussbaum, etc. I mean, it doesn't really morally matter. It doesn't, for the, the ones experiencing the harm, it does not matter how the harm came about. Of course. And, yeah. Well, I maybe have a question, but I don't know how to phrase this. Uh, it's about your definition of vulner vulnerability, but in the specific cases of uh, animal experimentation mm. and um, also uh, animals in the farm. In, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. in, in that um, they are vulnerable here because of uh, external conditions that we impose yeah. on them. And this is um, different from um, vulnerability in the case of uh, wild animals, for example. And just, I just maybe need um, to know if you have a, a way to specify um, the two different, different cases of vulnerability. Maybe you did already, sorry. No, no, it's <laughs> I, I noted it somewhere in the, yeah. big, in the definition yeah. of vulnerability, but um, it's right in the beginning. Yeah. So, um, so um, you're vulnerable, um, your vulnerability may manifest through yourself, yeah. external circumstances, or other living beings. So, um, in the case you said, well, um, it's us, human agents, moral agents, who do it in the case of um, animal experiment and factory farming. Yeah. It's sometimes, it's also it's sometimes um, moral patients in the case of wild animals. That's the case of predation. Um, but it's very often the circumstances, and as it is in our case, I mean, um, so we are. Uh, humans living, uh, humans who are victim of the uh, natural catastrophes. Yes. They are um, comparative. Some groups there are more vulnerable than others, and it's the circumstances that lead to that um, natural catastrophe. So yeah, you can distinguish it, but I wouldn't say it's. Um, I think whether one is. Morally, more or less, that yeah. Because it's somehow the vulnerability, the vulnerability is, and it's something that has been created by human beings. 
in the first case mm -hmm. and not in the second case. We cannot um, say that climate yeah. change create conditions of vulnerability as human beings create conditions of vulnerability. No? Um, I think it's, it's in that they no, yeah, intertwined it's is an, another moral issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, in some situations, so I think the animals are uh, vulnerable to start with, and then we increase yeah. this vulnerability. Yeah. While in the other case, um, it's circumstances yeah. that increase this. Now, the qu I think now if we have to decide to which one to give priority, I think you have to. One would be to say, well, the one that um, moral agents cause is more important, but I'm not sure I would subscribe to that because I would see what is more what what would be most efficient to reduce the most pain. I would say, although I would think that individuals have a duty to stop creating more vulnerabilities, but um, yeah, now I agree that there is a difference about its normative implications. I wouldn't say, yeah, for example, yeah, imagine you're uh, in an area where there is suddenly, a, I don't know, a cholera outbreak or so, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't say, well, this deserves less attention just because it's circumstantial. So I would be afraid. I wouldn't make a moral. I think then you really have to look at the cases. Yeah, right. But yeah. Other questions? Oui, je sais pas si c'est ça. Parce que la responsabilité morale alors, parce que même dans la nature, il y a quand même plein plein d'animaux. Ça rejoint un peu la question qui a été posée. Dans la nature, il y a il y a plein d'animaux qui qui sont très vulnérables. Le lion, je vais vraiment le, le vivre sans aller, sans aller quelque part. Euh, donc, donc, donc euh, en toute conséquence, euh, c est, c est, cette posture euh, d'égale considération par rapport à la souffrance vous met en situation de responsabilité énorme, de transformation, de transformation des relations intérieures de la nature, de telle sorte qu'il y ait moins de souffrance. C est, c est, c est, c est, ce ce, ce n'est pas à l'ordre du jour. Euh... Oui, je pense que ça met. Euh, oui, il y a une responsabilité morale assez grande. Après, il y a la question euh, de, de décider sur les priorités. Et ça, c'est. Oui, en fait, donc, c'est autre chose, ça. Et donc, sur la question d'un principe, vous jugez donc qu'il est, que est euh, comment dire, immoral, entre guillemets, que, que le lion ait mangé du nom de l'autre Non, je ne dis pas immoral. Je dis que ça. Non, il faut que ce n'est pas un agent moral. Je ne disais pas que ce n'est pas un agent moral, ce n'est pas immoral de... Non, je parle pas de la part du lion. Elle ne peut pas faire nous de laisser faire le lion. Non, je pense ça parce que c'est un cas difficile. Parce que, voilà, moi j'ai plutôt parlé des scénarios où c'était... Oui, mais quand on pose un principe d'égalité de considération, le problème antique, c'est la généralité du principe. Alors, c'est ma position, c'est que c'est un principe inapplicable. Alors j'essaie de vous montrer que c'est inapplicable. Euh... Mais, mais, alors qu'il soit appliqué, qu'il soit applicable dans certaines situations, ça crée les yeux. Mais ce pas ça l'intérêt de principe. Le principe la, la, la réflexion principale, c'est que c'est que c'est applicable dans toutes situations. Je trouve que ça conduit à des considérations qui sont quand même à la limite. Euh, mais je veux peut-être qu'on essaye d'interférer avec le comportement du lion pour qu'il qu devienne herbivore plutôt que carnivore. Et encore faudra-t-il se poser la question pourquoi ne pas respecter les herbes hein, Ça, c'est un autre type de question. Ouais, bon, Mais là, les herbes ne souffrent pas. Ne ouais. souffrent pas. Ouais, voilà, c'est une réponse vite et courte. Mais... Oui, oui, mais c'est parce que c'est une posture de, 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 de donner priorité à la souffrance. Enfin, bon, ça pose une question. Donc, euh, oui, si on prend le, le, le principe en, en sérieux, c'est en effet un, un des sujets qui est discuté à nos jours, en éthique animale. Oui, c'est une question assez importante. Parce que comme j'ai dit avant, pour, pour la cassette, ça ne change rien. Et puis, oui, mais après, comme j'ai dit dans ma présentation, après, il faut voir, hein, euh, il ne faut pas 
empirer la situation pour les animaux euh, concernés. Si après le lion meurt par euh, phare, euh, je pense qu'il y a une souffrance assez grande à, à prendre en considération. Ce qu'on peut faire, c'est... Bon, la prédation, c'est un peu l'extrême, mais euh, il y a... Il y a peut-être d'autres moyens pour voir où on peut améliorer la situation, pour un peu arriver à une considération un peu plus juste. Mais voilà, je vois que vous ne voulez vraiment pas accepter ce principe. Mais comme j'ai dit au début, moi je, je commence... Parce que si, si, on, si on prend ça en sérieux, ça, ça peut mener à, à d'autres scénarios avec lesquels j'ai plus de problèmes qu'avec qu la prédation. Donc comme j'ai dit, je commence à hésiter, mais a priori, je trouve que c'est un principe, euh, si on l'applique, euh, au moins pour le cas des êtres humains, il ne faut pas discriminer. Parce que là, vous êtes quand même d'accord, hein, il ne faut pas euh, equal consideration regardless of morally arbitrary criteria such as race and gender. Vous direz... À l'intérieur de l'espèce humaine, non Pardon À l'intérieur de l'espèce humaine, ça paraît évident. Ok. Et bien, ce n'est pas seulement là. Parce que là, bon, 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 je ne vais pas rentrer dans tout le temps, je ne sais pas même pas. Mais on pourrait même dire qu'il faut une, 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 une considération plus forte pour les, pour les gens les plus vulnérables. Donc c'est même, même plus loin. Mais, mais à l'intérieur de l'espèce humaine. Oui, ça, ça serait la, euh, la, la discrimination positive. Et puis ça, ça oui. peut être quelque chose qui mène à une égale considération. Donc là, il n'y a pas vraiment de... Oui, non, non. De, de non, c'est l'égale considération par rapport aux animaux, avec en plus... Une frontière difficile à poser entre un animal qui souffre et un animal qui ne souffre pas. Pourquoi c'est une frontière difficile ben, Elle est difficile, pratiquement. C'est pas ça, c'est le savoir que c'est un animal qui souffre et ce qui ne souffre pas. Le rapport à la conscience. Mais, mais c'est pas une question philosophique, c'est une question empirique. Ben, oui, oui non, mais alors qui a joué à la même, qui a joué à la même problématique parce oui, que oui, ça, 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 problème, ça, ça joue à la question du crapaud. <rire> ça joue à la question du crapaud. Ben, pour vous, apparemment, c'est pas un problème d'écraser un crapaud. Ben, euh, <rire> Il y a des gens qui accordent beaucoup d'importance. Non, 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 mais c'est la, la cohérence du principe. Quand on ouais. pose un principe qui est. Qui, de nouveau, est... je pense que vous devez savoir que euh, je pense que ça présuppose qu'on sait quels intérêts sont là à la base. Et puis après, il faut voir si c'est vraiment le, le même intérêt. Parce que si ce n'est pas le même, alors euh, il ne faut pas appliquer ce principe. Si c'est le même, il faut voir. Euh, et puis décider après, en prenant en compte les autres facteurs, vous donner la priorité. Voilà. Mais je, ouais, je pense que je ne vais pas vous convaincre. Difficilement. Difficilement. Non, mais on discuter. Oui. Hein, on va voir les contradictions laquelle ça mène. Quoi. C est, c est... Non, mais comme je l'ai dit, hein, je, parce que là, avec mon nouveau projet, je vois que ça mène à encore plus de, de, de soucis Monsieur qui sont très contre-intuitifs. Et là, j'ai commencé à me, peu mettre, me le remettre en question. Mais je ne suis pas encore là pour le vraiment vouloir laisser tomber. Parce qu'il me faut quand même une bonne alternative. Vous êtes comme les scientifiques, ils ont besoin d'une biologie. Même si elle est fausse, ils ont besoin d'une biologie. Ah, mais c'est comme ça, les scientifiques, c'est comme ça. Non, mais moi, je suis ouverte à une nouvelle théorie, si, si elle est bonne. Donc. Mais bon, peut-être dans 5 ans. Je, je peux vous dire par quoi on peut remplacer le principe d'égale considération dans le cas des animaux. Peut-être, j'espère. Merci beaucoup. Merci.